This isn't live, by the way, right? No, no, it's not. Right. My guest today is Professor Henry Greenside, who is Professor of Physics and Neurobiology at Duke University. His research group study problems in theoretical neurobiology. Welcome, Henry. Thank you. I know that you're working on a book, Matter to Minds, a physics perspective on how nervous systems produce behavior. Um, I don't know much about this, but it's an area of great interest to me. Um, so that the draft that you had sent me, you start off with sort of the goal of neuroscience. You say, understanding how nervous systems produce behavior. Um, you want to talk a bit about that? Um, you know, I hear that uh, people say the brain is the, the most complex thing. Some, some people say in the universe, but I, I ask, uh, do we know what else is out there? <laughs> we don't. Exactly. So, but, but it's pretty complex. Um, but uh, it also produces a complex set of behaviors that seems to be sort of individual specific too, right? Uh, there yeah. are some commonality, but also individual specific. So, so what is sort of your hypothesis as to how the brain comes up with these uh, odd behaviors, let's call it, um, uh, of humans, for example? So I, I don't address in my book, and I actually don't know, and I think most people don't know, how the behavior, how brains, especially human brains, produce the kinds of diversity of behavior that you're talking about. Why some people have intellectual quirks and some people are passionate about poetry or in the hate physics intensely and vice versa. Or why I largely was uninterested in biology until well after my PhD and why many biology, those kinds of things, I, I don't understand. I don't know, based on my knowledge of current neuroscience, we're quite far from understanding higher level of cognitive preferences or biases of that kind. The, what I do address in the book and closer to what I know is trying to ask, how do you frame the question? What does it mean to understand how a brain produces behavior or more generally how a nervous system produces behavior? Um, th th this, th this question, th th the reason when, what, what I was motivated to ask in this book and one of my motivations for writing the book was many neurobiology talks that I listened to at Duke and elsewhere. We, we have a really excellent a colloquium series in the neurobiology department. And to my astonishment, speaker after speaker, uh, even very illustrious, even Nobel Prize winning speakers, they never really say, what is the goal of the whole field? Or, you know, how do we know we're finished? Or how do we know if we've made progress? And also stunning to me is they never mention that there are any other hard problems in nature to think about. So it, it, when, you, when you hear a neurobiology talk, it's like it's the only problem in existence that ever existed. It's the only one people are thinking about. As you just mentioned a minute ago, a, a commonly made statement is what is the most, you know, that the brains are the most complex structures, but what do they mean by complex? And, and are they claiming that no one else deals with complex structures, thought about it? So, so this triggers strong emotions in me as a physicist that, there, that many neurobiologists, although they're excellent scientists, are largely unaware because of their training as undergraduates and graduates of what people in physics, engineering, astrophysics, meteorology, even other areas of biology have studied and th thought about. So it's a very interesting paradox that neuroscience is one of the most interdisciplinary fields of science and yet the neurobiologists themselves have one of the least interdisciplinary backgrounds. They don't, they, they don't know math beyond calculus. Many of them have only taken one year of physics and never used it. The, the introductory courses at the undergraduate level at, at Duke and many other places, the textbooks don't use the math the students have actually learned. And so one of the purposes of my book is to try to bring a knowledge of how, of other fields, especially physics, because that's what I'm most knowledgeable about. But in my book, I also talk about computer science because there's many interesting analogies and insights from computer science and, and just try to bring them to the public so that they can start to appreciate that we actually do know the answer partly to what is a complex system, that this has actually been studied in parallel with neuroscience for decades, if not centuries, that progress in these non-biological fields have immense implications for neuroscience that, they're not, that the neuroscientists are not aware about. So just as one example, in 1963, 
a brilliant meteor theoretical meteorologist by the name of Edward Lorenz. He was at MIT running a extremely simple computer code on a 1963 supercomputer, which was less powerful than your wristwatch, way less powerful. He made a stunning conceptual discovery that it would never be possible to forecast weather more than about two weeks into the future. It, it didn't have to do with technology. He, he could make this statement with confidence in 1963, even though computers got way more powerful, algorithms got much more powerful and sophisticated because it was the deep geometric scientific reason that the weather was in, inherently unstable in a deep mathematical way that would prevent such accurate forecasting. And now in the year 2000, in 2021, we know from experiments and theory that the brain has the same chaotic instability that the weather does, which means that certain questions like, can I predict your behavior or my behavior precisely more than maybe a few minutes into the future, almost certainly cannot be answered. Hmm. It's intrinsically impossible the same way that, um, that Lorenz realized that the weather systems can't be forecast precisely. But by the way, to, to just to clarify, yeah. what Lorenz discovered was not that you couldn't say anything about the weather. You, you can predict average structures like the average number of thunderstorms. And we know by simulations how they increase with climate warming. There's statistical questions that can be answered with fairly good precision. But if you want to know a precise, important question, like whether a tornado will hit a particular city at a particular time, that kind of precise question cannot be answered by any known mechanism more than two weeks into the future. Mm -hmm. So I could probably predict what a person's choices will be and the likelihood of those choices, but a precise pre prediction of what am I going to eat for dinner, who am I going to spend time with in the afternoon, what book in the library I'm going to read, those precise decisions are probably going to lie beyond, if for the arbitrary future, because of known nonlinear science and advances, that probably cannot be answered by any future ability in neuroscience. And yet the whole neuroscience community is enthusiastically moving ahead, pretending that all answers are, are answerable. All questions that they ask are answerable. And they're blissfully unaware of, of Turing's ideas in computer science, that there are problems that no computer can solve, the ideas in nonlinear dynamics due to Lorenz and others, that there are hard limits to what can be predicted about certain physical systems. But this largely is not part of the awareness of vocabulary or training of neuroscience. And it plays a big role that the, the nervous systems are not magical entities that, that only belong to the neurobiologists. There are big systems of atoms, and many of their properties are understandable by already existing science. And th these two communities largely don't overlap or aren't aware of each other. Yeah, so yeah, so as you say, it's a very interdisciplinary, um, there, there are interdisciplinary possibilities here, but it hasn't quite happened. Um, but you know, from a design perspective, from an engineering perspective, people would say complexity is not a very good good feature. You know, if I design something and you, I say the, the automobile or a computer is very complex, um, that's not a very good, very good thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, and nature through evolution didn't have a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, simplification processes. So we, we do have a very complex organ. But the fundamental question, as you say, is what does it do? What right. does it produce? Um, and whether we can see some patterns in it. The weather uh, example is really a really good one. You say when you, when you look at complex systems, chaotic systems, we cannot have precise predictions of the future. And that appears to be the case for the brain too. We, uh, but it seems like- it's what, Yes, it's widely believed that, that this is, that's correct. I, I would say that's my belief, yes. Yeah. But a lot of people I hear, you know, a lot of neuroscientists are still, as you say, working on uh, sort of the hardware question. You know, can we really figure out what the neurons are doing? How are they communicating? And can we then extend that to uh, perhaps uh, some sort of a disease level intervention or yes. behavior level intervention? So it's sort of a bottom up view, sort of a reductionist view. Uh, but we haven't really gone too far with it, right, so far? I, I would say that's correct, and and in my book, I and, and as many people who work with neuroscience know, it's far worse than you think. The the just as two examples, I can mention briefly. Um, if you're a lobster or a crab, 
you don't have teeth. And when you need to eat something, you tear a chunk of food off with your claws, swallow it, and then you grind it with sand or dirt particles that are in your stomach. This is also how dinosaurs eat grass. They, they have these big gizzard stones. So the, the lobsters and crabs have evolved a intricate rhythm generating circuit in their nervous system to rhythmically rub and crush the food in their stomach. So there's a specific little ganglion. It's a subpart of the nervous system of crabs and lobsters called the stomatogastric ganglion. And its purpose in the universe is to generate multiple rhythms that help the animal digest food under different circumstances. This little cluster has 30 neurons um, and it its circuitry is basically fully known. All the wires in that interconnect them are known. The neuron, neurons are big enough that people can stick it. They, they actually have sort of personal names. They're, the, the neuron, neuron's unique. You can measure the properties of each one of them. You can simulate on a computer and reproduce with good um, accuracy the rhythms that one of these experimentally removed ganglia would produce. But now you can ask a question you're asking, do I understand how the rhythms come out of the circuit of just 30 neurons? And the answer is we don't know. We, we, we can simulate on a computer, we can reduce behavior, but if you ask what was the design logic, if you're an electrical engineer and said, why did the animal evolve to have these neurons hooked up the way they do? Some of it makes sense, but largely we don't know what is the mechanism or the design principle of this tiny little dedicated circuit whose only purpose not to think or cogitate is just generate rhythms. So, so generally, this little thing generates six to eight rhythms. And one of the complications that makes it hard for me and others uh, to understand is some discoveries by Eve Martyr, a, a highly, a, a, one of the leaders in neuroscientists and not neuroscience at Brandeis. She discovered that this little circuit responds to 50 different chemicals that are floating around in the body. And each of these chemicals can alter the behavior of the rhythms. And, and so right away, so forget the human brain, forget consciousness. But forget some of the grand questions. As a theorist or just a scientist, I'd really like to know what what is it about this little circuit of 30 neurons that requires having to respond to 50 different neuromodulators, produce different rhythms. Of, uh, this is an example of how even a very small piece of neural circuitry is not understood in the sense that I can design an electronic circuit with resistors, transistors, and exactly know what it's going to do. When I turn a knob, like I increase resistance, I immediately know what the what, if it's going to oscillate faster or slower. But this is this tiny little circuit already is beyond the understanding, at least in a conceptual or functional level. We again, we can reproduce on a computer, and that's satisfying. But if, if you said, "Is this how I would design a stomatogastric ganglion oscillator?" I, I've never seen a paper that underlines the design logic. So, so, so yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. It looks like you have a question. No, no. So, I mean, we have tried this in different scales too, right? So, from C. elegans at 30 neurons to the zebrafish at 100,000 to humans right. at 100 billion. Uh, we have tried it in different scales, but it, it doesn't appear to give us a lot of insights. Yeah, I, I would say that, that the entire theoretical infrastructure is not ready. Or, or is too young to handle the kinds of questions being raised, not just by neuroscience, but also in other parts of biology. By the way, my, my own vote for the most complicated system that, that humans know is not the nervous system, but the gene regulatory network in every cell. That even if you go to the level of a bacterium, which has a nucleus and has genes and has these, these proteins that, that the, these transcription factors that at turn, and turn genes on and off and they can interact with each other, that already is plenty complex enough to confuse everybody. And there's no gene regulatory network that's been fully figured out yet. It's, we, we have a, this is another class of problem where there might be 10,000 or 20,000 or more interacting components. And they, they interact in a very intricate way. And we don't have the language mathematically or, or elsewhere of how to describe a system, an inhomogeneous system with many different components. The, the brain is, is yet another example of many different parts interacting on many different time scales. And, and it looks like a couple of things like we're familiar with, like the, the, the model that Lorenz came up in the weather, like um, dynamical systems, which is my own training in physics. 
but it's got flavors that are that lie outside anything we've the physicists or engineers, which is mainly the fact that the animal has to exist in nature and survive in a very intricate, uh, hostile, fluctuating environment. And, and so the, the way to think of a nervous system is what an electrical engineer would have to design if the circuit was constantly being attacked and, and running out of power and it had to survive on its own. You, you've got to throw all kinds of things that you never anticipated together to, to, to get it to survive the, what the world throws at it. So even the simplest circuit like this, ga this somatic gastric ganglion is helping the animal survive in ways that we don't know. This is the hard part of doing neuroscience is we can look at the circuitry, we can simulate on a computer. We don't know what the animal, why the animal evolved to have these different rhythms and these different control mechanisms because we don't know over the 10 million years that the lobster or crabs evolved, why does it need these rhythms? And if you don't know that, it's very hard to look at the circuitry and understand its function. Yeah, I mean, clearly evolution is a very error-prone process. Um, you get selected with a bunch of errors, and uh, it gets accumulated over a long period of time. Uh, the end outcome is, <laughs> is neither predictable nor understandable uh, yes. in many ways. Uh, but I wanted to touch on, um, you know, the, the idea of consciousness um, uh, fascinates uh, general public. Uh, I would just touch on that. Uh, I have heard humans say only humans are conscious. And I often wondered, how do we know that? Uh, do we have any, any reason to say that? So I, I would recommend you get some other experts on consciousness on your program. Um, I, I, I've thought about this a lot, but I would have to say that most of my interests, I, consciousness is so difficult to define and so difficult to quantify that many quantitative oriented scientists, including myself, get away from it as fast as possible. But while it's one of the most interesting questions, it's one of the nastiest, if, especially if you're a physicist, because you have to ask, what am I going to measure that tells me something useful besides verbal description? What, what I can tell you is that there's a growing trend that would argue that nearly all animals, starting at the level of a fly and above, have some degree of consciousness or, or self-awareness that, that humans and even primates are not don't, don't have a monopoly on consciousness. But then it gets very tricky how to say, what do you mean by consciousness and how I define it? Many behaviorists and psychologists and experimental neuroscientists would argue that there's consciousness just because when you start looking very carefully at, let's say, what a fly can do in its behavior, it seems to detect patterns and show awareness and thoughtfulness and decision-making that are very far from reflex behavior. It, it seems quite capable of saying, okay, I've got a female on, a, on my right and I need to mate. I've got some food on the left and I'm hungry. How am I going to make a decision? And it doesn't just make a reflex decision. It seems to actually weigh, and weigh signals and senses from the environment that lead it to a decision. This kind of information processing seems similar to what humans carry out when, they, when they're when they conscious. And, and, yeah. and just one other comment, I apologize yeah. to cut you off. Um, one of the really great discoveries of neuroscientists over the last 40 years, I, I would in, describe in my own words, that consciousness is greatly overrated. And, and what I mean by that is, in evidence shows that all kinds of nervous systems, flies, mice, birds, snakes, octopuses, and humans, that your consciousness is, is aware of an incredibly tiny fraction of what the nervous system is doing at any given point. And, and so while you feel great and you're conscious and you're moving around the world and you're perceiving things, most of your brain is doing a lot of other stuff that you have no awareness of. Many, many people are aware of this. If you solve a crossword puzzle or a math puzzle, you've probably noticed, or you're trying to figure out how do I pack my six suitcases into a car that only will easily hold four, the solution suddenly pops into your mind without any awareness of how you obtained it. There's a lot of unaware computing, filtering and processing going on. My own view is that's a huge part of what your brain is doing. And so it's a little bit unfair to say consciousness is the only or the main interesting question when there's all this extremely rich dynamics and information processing taking place that's unfortunately outside your awareness. So, so I think consciousness is overrated in the sense that it's a fraction and a tiny fraction, maybe not even the most important fraction of what many brains are doing. And, and it's that other part that really interests me.
Yeah, I mean, that, that's going to say, you know, um, I was thinking that uh, consciousness is sort of a product of overcapacity, or a product of luxury, you know. Um, when we look at the world as an economic system, you know, we think about leisure and, you know, 8.4 billion people, 8 billion of them have actually don't have much leisure. The other 400 right. million talk a lot about leisure, how to utilize it and, you know, all of that. Uh, and consciousness is sort of in a similar vein, which is if you are if you are you know sort of following your basic objective function, uh, food, replication, sleep, um, you don't really have time to be conscious, so to speak, even though the brain has the capacity to be conscious. So and I, so, I, I, I would actually disagree with that. Okay. And and here's my argument: uh, the um, you're, you're an organism moving around the world. You, you need things to eat, you need shelter. As you move around, you, you, you have, and you have sensory input, you have eyes. As you move around, inevitably, your, the, your body itself comes under the, and enters your sensational input. That as you see your eyes and your hands moving, you hear yourself making noises. You, you can't avoid the fact that if you're moving around the world, you necessarily, your brain necessarily becomes aware that part of you is is also in the world. So I, I think that part of consciousness is the fact that your brain has to include, develop internal models of its environment to survive. It inevitably has to include part of your own actions because you can't hide them from your own sensory input. And so when, you, when you're, and, and then especially in a social circumstance, when, a, when you're a group in a group of people, it's to your advantage to have ways to model or predict what the others are doing. And the strong evolutionary, I, I would argue the strong evolutionary selection to enhance your and other people's abilities to model your, how you are going to interact with these other people so you don't precipitate a fight or you know, ruin your marriage or something else where you mis make a misjudgment. So I would argue that, that you, you have to develop some kind of self-awareness. This might not be the one of, uh, that, that, that the highest level that we're aware of, but Inevitably, because your brain tries to model and predict what's going on in the world, and that helps you survive, you can't avoid including yourself because you're, you're part of your sensory input. If, if you bang your hand against something, you you notice that, and that that parts that gets incorporated into whatever your model, your brain is doing to try to understand it's re, your, the relation of you to the world. So I, I actually would argue it's unavoidable that, and that's why flies could be conscious because they too would be aware of their buzzing wings and if they bump into glass that they can't see, they, they somehow start realizing their body is part of their sensory input and they can start to include that in an internal model. But whether they- yeah, that, I, I wonder- Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I wonder if there are multiple levels of consciousness. So, you know, as you say, self-awareness um, is at one level, you know, if. I need to be self-aware to execute my simple objective function, which I would argue as sustenance, replication, you know, a few factors in there. If I'm not self-aware, there is no real need for executing that objective function. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, and then there is potentially a higher order uh, consciousness, um, which is, I think, sort of an uh, in, 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 perhaps an indication of excess capacity in the sense that you know, you can think of things uh, when you have leisure, when you have uh, excess neurons <laughs> that you can deploy. Um, and I don't know what that actually means. Is it just that the brain is sort of playing around for its own utility enhancement, or is there something more to it than that? I, I don't know enough. I, 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 and I would argue based on the literature and colleagues I talked to, I don't think I think many people give you speculations and biased guesses, but I don't think we really know the answer to that. I, I think you can assume that evolution is extremely economical and it's extremely rare to develop capacities that are that truly go unused. So, so what, what, when you say that you might not, and I agree with you, there are times during the day when you don't need to be aware and I don't know if you're, even then, your your brain is probably doing some kind of problem solving. For example, when people sleep, there's a lot of belief. We still don't know the purpose of sleep. Another example is 
a basic human behavior that, that still is poorly understood from a neurobiological point of view. But there's a lot of evidence to suggest that your brain is doing active problem solving as in sleep, that, that rats and mice who've been exposed to mazes are running those mazes in their dreams and maybe finding more efficient ways to solve this, I think, strong evidence that the brain doesn't go to waste. And while your consciousness might not be where maybe you're daydreaming, you're actually doing some deep problem solving or, or data analysis that's preparing you for some later, for it to be successful in some later event that, that requires you to survive or uh, increase your ability to pass genes on to the next generation. So I'm, I'm very skeptical of people who say we don't use 90% of our brain or that when you're daydreaming, you're not doing anything. That that's a wasted opportunity to increase your ability to survive. And I strongly suspect that what you're saying is a statement of awareness. But but the other parts of your brain that you're not aware of that are doing a lot of things, even if you're not aware of them. So, so the, you know, please go ahead. Sorry. So so one chapter you have is uh, understanding physical systems. So you sort of uh, start with physics um, and, and look at you know various physical systems. We're still trying to understand many of them, um, especially, you know, really the, the nonlinear ones and the, the, the quantum mechanics aspect of uh, uh, small systems still not fully understood. So there's sort of complexity there. Um, and, and how are you making the connection between complex physical systems ultimately with uh, the nervous system? So I, I apologize. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Yeah, how are you making the connection between complex physical systems and uh, the, the 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 neural systems of so, biology? Okay, yeah. let, let me see if I can say something useful in that, and just cut me off if I drift in the wrong direction or not saying something useful. There are some systems that have a lot of parts. Um, a magnet would be one of them. Non-biological non systems, a turbulent fluid that are very difficult to understand in the sense that it, you can't easy, solve the mathematics related to them by hand. They're very difficult to describe verbally. Um, they, they're, it's hard to predict their behavior. And yet we've discovered concise mathematical rules that can be used to calculate almost any, the answer to almost any question you ask about them. So, so this is one of the paradox that I mentioned in the book and that the general public is largely not aware of and, and leads to an answer to your question about how to think about complex systems versus nervous systems. Physicists or, or the human race more generally and collectively have been extraordinarily lucky and fortunate in discovering some fundamental laws of physics. And, and they have, they're astounding, but it, it, when you, when you, one of the beauties of being a physicist is you get to appreciate the Schrodinger's equation or the Maxwell equations of light, electricity, and magnetism, they're, they're extremely concise in, in modern mathematical notation. There might be a line, the, the Schrodinger equation is a single line long that describes all of quantum mechanical phenomena. The Maxwell equations describe light, they're three or four lines long. So, so here's a paradox. The laws of nature, the, the fundamental physics laws are extremely concise, extremely general, and as far as we know, incredibly precise. No one's ever found a wrong calculation doing in quantum mechanics, um, but they can only be applied over short periods of time and only short periods of space before they get too hard to work with. So hydrogen atom, we can solve with enormous insight and even mathematically as an undergraduate, you learn to actually calculate the full solution. But as soon as you go to a, a, something like water with, with a, a oxygen, you can't calculate anything by hand and you have to turn to a computer to sort of get what, figure out what's going on. So, so, there's fun, so, so there's two points I wanted to make. One is that the fundamental laws of physics, as powerful and as useful they are, they're only useful over very short periods of time or very short regions of space. And as soon as you apply them to spatially extended systems, like fluids, like a nervous system, extremely difficult to apply them and you basically have to turn to a computer. Second, there's a completely different branch of physics called statistical physics, where, and, and this is, by the way, Einstein's favorite branch of physics, not even his own relativity he considered his favorite, um, where the goal is to try to understand how a huge number of interacting items, like molecules in a, in a gas or molecules in a liquid, um, try to see if they're principles, mathematical principles that 
determine what's going on. And here too was a huge amount of success. People, physicists and also mathematicians and chemists, it wasn't just physicists, discovered very powerful principles, which are the foundation of the branch of statistical physics that allow you to calculate the properties of problems that you would think would be insoluble, soluble, like how does a metal become magnetic? Or when you cool it, how does it become a superconductor? Or when you squeeze a gas, how does it turn into a liquid? These questions you would think would be impossible because at the fundamental physics level of atoms interacting, you've got a, Avogadro's number, 10 to the 24 particles interacting. And yet people have been able to discover some extremely powerful, widely useful, quantitatively accurate principles that allow you to calculate the, pro the, pro the properties of liquid, solids, electronic circuits, transistors, um, the, the properties of, of cells in biology. So here's a question I address in my book, and I address it in, in discussing it, but not explaining it. What is it about nervous systems where this formalism from physics fails? You, you can't apply statistical physics directly to nervous systems. It, it violates some of the assumptions that allow these powerful principles. So, so, so the way I pose the question is, what is it about physical systems, even if they're complex like a magnet, which is actually very complicated, and they're parts of magnetism and superconductivity that people are still struggling to understand to date in the sense of being able to deduce it. What, where is the gap? Where, where is the line that separates a complex physical system like a magnet from a tiny nervous system like the ganglion that I mentioned or the nervous system of C. elegans, which is only 300 neurons in size? What, what is it where the physicists lose their ability to use these powerful general principles? And what, what I mentioned in the book is two things that are unique to biology that largely um, physicists aren't ready to deal with and or trained to deal. One is the extraordinary inhomogeneity of, of biological systems. This is, even when we're dealing with crystals or liquids or superconductors, the, we're dealing with macroscopic objects where all the pieces are the same. One of the cool things in physics is every electron is exactly the same. Every proton is exactly the same. We don't have to mess with a huge universe of different neurons, which we still don't know how to classify. And the system, a giant crystal of iron is homogeneous. It's got the same little chunks repeating each other periodically throughout space. And then you go to a bacterium, forget a nervous, a neuron or a nervous system, and it's filled with immense pieces of junk from a physicist's point of view. It's got myomolecules and they're all different and they're all different lengths and all different shapes and they're unknown functionality. And we just don't know how to put together uh, this is because science and math are still really young. Even for a single bacterium, we don't know how to think about systems that have that degree of heterogeneity. They, 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 the key thing that makes physics work in many cases is the symmetry. We have the same periodic crystal. The pieces are all the same. Without that assumption, a lot of our abilities as physicists or mathematicians or theorists falls apart right away because of the enormous heterogeneity of even the smallest biological systems. And nervous systems are incredibly heterogeneous. They're not like an Intel integrated circuit where every transistor is identical, every wire is the same in its properties. That You're struggling with immense details that are all a little bit different, all selected by evolution for certain functions we don't fully understand. And then you're trying to explain consciousness. It's a... It's a so so, so one of the sort of challenging questions out there is how do you define life? So this is sort of where you are, you know, sort of when you make a distinction between a physical system and a biological system, how do we define life uh, is a challenging question. So I was thinking when you were talking that this might be an interesting uh, definition, which is a, a physical system is predictable and a biological system with life is not predictable. Uh, at least it's not predictable in long time or space uh, coordinates, right? It, it is, it, it, the, the behavior is not predictable. So, so suppose I'm given something, uh, something that I don't know, and somebody asks me, you know, is this, does it have life or not? I can probably come up with a test, right? Uh, with some, if I can predict it, I could then say that is probably not life. Is that is that a fair way to think about it? I, I think that question is so hard that I'm not fully qualified to answer it. <laughs> but according to your definition, if you focus on predictability, 
you would have to declare the atmosphere of the earth and the sun itself to be living organisms. They're completely right. unpredictable in, in, in many <coughs> practical, important ways. <coughs> and <coughs> in that way, they're, they're analogous to a living creature. <coughs> Excuse me, I have to take a break and get a drink. Yeah, that is interesting. I mean, we have a lot of uh, effort going on on exoplanets and um, exoplanet biology. And, you know, if you were to get some data, how do we determine, how do we assign a problem with <coughs> something out there? <laughs> so what, what, I was, yeah, what I was asking was, uh, Henry, that, you know, it, there's a lot of effort going on on exoplanets and exoplanet biology and so on. People out there looking for extraterrestrial life. Um, are there ways we can think about as you contrast between physical systems and nervous systems and biological systems and more generally, uh, are there heuristics, ideas that we could apply uh, to answer that question? That, that's a great question and I would like to know the answer myself. I, I know, I, I'm absolutely not an expert to give you a useful opinion. Um, People, a lot of people from many different communities have tried to pin down a definition of life. And my sense is that no one has succeeded. That, that people would say, oh, it's got to be chemically based. It has to undergo evolution. There has to be a component that encodes information like DNA that can be acted on to store information. Um, but that's only the life that we know on Earth. And, and uh, I, I think the answer, the, the answer is not really known. I, I think one way that people would approach it, and I actually mentioned this a little bit in my book, is to what extent life on Earth is inevitable. So many scientists would point out that the, the way our universe is set up, all the elements are created in the same way, in the same amount by stars. And so if you go to any star system elsewhere in the universe, it's going to have roughly the same amount of hydrogen. It produces by nuclear synthesis the same amount of hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon, oxygen. So many planets that are orbiting in the Goldilocks range around a sun like our Earth will very likely have similar, will have water and the same kind of building ingredients. And so maybe it's very likely that they'll bootstrap themselves up into proteins because of Miller's 1953 experiment showing that if you shoot sparks into a soup of, of oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon, and it, it, you start getting a slime that has biological like molecules in it. So, so some people would argue that because of the way atoms are synthesized by stars, because chemistry is universal, that the, the, the mechanism by which life formed on Earth um, has to appear elsewhere. Therefore, the, uh, the, although we don't know what life is in general, Earth-like chemical life has a high probability of probably being existing. And then you know the answer to your question, you start looking for Use, you, point a microscope, you point a spectroscope at a atmosphere that's 50 light years away of a planet 50, and then you look for chlorophyll, you look for spe spectral, you look for photons coming out of big biological molecules of the kind that we have on Earth. But, but if life is something else, if it's silicon-based or on, on, on Titan, if there's methane-based slow chemistry based on chemistry, you're, you're, we're lost. We, we, we wouldn't recognize it and we wouldn't know how to identify it. So, so I, I don't know the answer for that, but I think one of the hints that it might not be impossible to answer is a cosmological answer that, that the ingredients for building Earth-like life are widely available throughout the universe. And almost certainly in the 10 to the 20 known stars in, in the known universe, there's got to be Earth-like water systems that are baking and cooking and being struck by lightning that, that might... So, so hopefully they will have evolve to produce complex biomolecules because one of the few things we do understand is if you don't have if you don't produce molecules that are big enough with a certain complexity you can't you can't carry out chemical reactions that are selective you, you can't carry you can't produce life with very simple molecules you, you have to get to a certain minimum complexity of molecules to have enzymes and dna and replication and so those those signatures would be a strong hint of some kind of life yeah, so another chapter you have, or, you know, the, the book that you're working on, is similarities and difference between nervous systems and computers. Right. Uh, I sometimes, you know, uh, try to make some uh, analogy from uh, from the brain to the computer, and neuroscientists don't like it at all. So, um, 
Let, let, let me start with the similarities. What, what are the similarities that you see between nervous systems and computers? Uh, so the similarities is, is that, um, and I'm going to speak as a physicist now, that the, the, the essence of a computer and the essence of a biological system is that there are physical structures that have different states. They, that computers, the states are not are very easy to define. A you can have a bit or a, which is one or zero, and that corresponds in a computer chip to a high high current or strong current and a, or a weak current. Um, and you can chip, you encode information by changing between states. So so when a computer's sorting numbers or doing a simulation. What it's doing is switching between the bit. The bits are switching between ones and zeros, and and nervous systems also have physical states, and and they're much more complicated to find because the states are spread out over the behavior of biomolecules, and you have to look at an entire nervous synapse, which is a micron-sized structure with an awful lot of internal structure to identify the state. But what a nervous system does is exactly similar to a computer and that it encodes information by physical, physically stable states and then transition to them um, from, by, from one state to another. So by the way, Jill, you're, did we, oh yeah, your, your, your camera went blind. All I'm saying is the GE. Hold on. Uh, did we just, I lost, I lost uh, power for a minute. So. Oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> so, so um, you're asking a, a really deep and interesting question, which is, what do you mean by a computer in general? So, one answer is it's the von Neumann digital architecture based on based on bits switching. Many people would say that's a very narrow view of computers. Any physical system that has states that are distinguishable and that can be store information, you have a mechanism for switching the states. That's a computer. Turing's idea of a computer, which is very abstract, would be anything that has states that can switch from one. So, so in the end, I would say that the difference is, is one of kind rather than fundamental. That the nervous systems have internal, stable, distinguishable physical states, and they can switch between them just like a computer. And then the question is more an engineering one, which is what's, what's the convenient way to translate information you want to store or manipulate into a nervous system versus a computer. And then you get into very different games from an engineering point of view, because a brain computer has to survive under all kinds of hectic conditions, hunger, disease, parasites that are creeping into your nervous system and possibly killing off neurons. Um, the, you, as a human being or an animal, you have to deal with a very complex unpredictable environment. So you have to evolve to be able to filter signals from that environment to determine which are the important ones to survive. So a lot of the difference, in my point of view, between a computer and the brain or nervous system is not how they work, but the what the different goals are they have to satisfy. And, and until recently, with, with machine learning, computers didn't have to deal with complex images and, and cars driving and rainstorms and trying to decipher, is that a trash can on my right or did I just hit a hit a person walking across the street. These kind of ambiguous, high dimensional, murky signals, uh, we figured out how to do by selection, evolutionary selection, and um, our brains are very good at rapid filtering. The other thing that we, uh, our nervous, distinguished nervous systems from computers is because of evolution, we started with little nervous systems and evolved the big ones. We've always had to be very, uh, careful in how we use power, or how much food we consume. And so, so nervous systems are fantastically efficient in doing a lot of computation with a small amount of energy. And they put to shame even the smallest and best computers at the electrical engineers. So, so that constrains, you don't have much power, you don't have much space. If you're a fly, you have to fit your entire computer into the head of a, a, you know, something very tiny and get it off the ground. A lot of engineering constraints lead to what the, the complexity of nervous systems because of the constraints needed to survive under very harsh conditions. But if it is purely an efficiency differential, um, it seems to me that's an engineering question, which is 
one would argue we will solve it over time, that our computers will get more powerful, more efficient, uh, less power consumptive, and, right. and all of that over time. Yes. So if it is purely a hardware question, then we are, I think, on our way to replicate the brain. But, but some say it's not, it's not really a hardware issue. Um, well, it, it could be a hardware issue, but there is a design question, which is, uh, you know, we are attempting quantum computing. Uh, we yes. have a few qubits. There, there are, so there's a hypothesis that the brain is a quantum computer, but we can probably get there as well. Um, but is this sort of fundamental architectural problem, which is the way that we're designing computers today, are quite different from how the brain is designed. It, it seems like a very, very messy design <laughs> inside the brain that, that gives you this sort of behavioral variations that we don't see from a computer, right? I, I would probably disagree with the word messy. That's more of a statement of our lack of knowledge of what the brain has to do. Um, I, I would challenge you to invent a fly's brain <laughs> that, can, that can sense thousands of odors, um, fly with very high speed and, and reorient, and do it with a very tiny amount of power, you know, a little lick of sugar. Um, I, I think the point I'd like to come back to is the one you just made, ago, made a minute ago about to what extent these are engineering constraints. What many people are realizing as we study the brain is that we've underappreciated how much structure there is in biological systems. So we, we look at an animal and we see its surface and you know you eat a chicken and you see the chicken bones and a few muscles. But what you don't have what people don't have firsthand appreciation of is how many atoms there are in any biological creature, including a bacterium, and how much flexibility there is in these many different atoms to do things. And, and because evolution started at the bacterial level, and had gazillion generations to tinker with ways of doing things, biological cells have figured out how to do things with very few parts, very tiny volume, very little energy that are way ahead of what the human race, which has started with objects the size of our hands, and, and now we're descending to smaller levels. The, the, the smaller structures at the atomic level, biology said it is way ahead because they have a lot more time to tinker. And so I'd argue, what I would argue is I would agree with the point you were about to make I think inevitably computers will catch up and exceed every detail of even human nervous systems. And the only thing holding us back is we don't have the technology to manipulate things at the level of atoms that biology has figured out to do two billion years ago when you're a little evolving bacteria. And, and one of the things that makes brains challenging is how hard it is for us to grasp how much detail there is down to the micron level or submicron level that's available to be participating in information processing. Yeah. And that, 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 you know, you look at a single transistor on a modern circuit, that's, that's a huge object compared to what biology is capable of manipulating at the molecular level. So, so, the, so what I, I'd say that it is a hardware issue. And I think it's inevitable that over time we will learn how to gain or we'll gain mastery of, of objects down to the small molecular atom level. And at that point, we will surpass what biology did because we'll know design principles of how to do things that evolution had to discover very ineffectively. And, and quantum computing would be an example of that where in principle, we could bypass a lot of the difficulties of, of traditional transistor-based computers and switch to a completely different format for computing. I also think, Henry, it's a software issue. So. Uh, you know, the, uh, we have a lot of people, you know, very excited about deep learning. Right. Uh, some of the mathematics that came around it. Um, uh, we have some famous engineers in the famous West Coast company saying deep learning will solve everything. Uh, right. You know, there's no problem deep learning cannot solve. Right. And I'm sitting here thinking, um, I mean, it's 60s technology. You know, we, we got some fancy mathematics recently and a lot of computing power and memory and all of that. We still cannot generalize any new uh, idea. You know, uh, we can we can say you know we can differentiate cats and dogs, uh, buses and cars, uh, which are exceptionally good uh, right. ideas. Uh, but we cannot generalize uh, new things. Um, nor I, I really object to this term artificial intelligence. 
Uh, that's because we don't know what intelligence is, and then how, how could we right. define artificial intelligence? That's, that's as nasty as life. You, you get, <laughs> I didn't know when I, I didn't know when I was going to talk to you. You're going to hit me with some of the hardest questions that people are thinking about right now. And intelligence in life, I, I would say, really hard, hard, challenging questions. But please continue. So you're you're going to ask the question about intelligence? Yeah. So so I, I was going in the softer direction. So I, I was wondering. Um, the neuroscientists study the hardware, it seems to be. A lot of, lot of, lot of time is spent on hardware. Yes. But there is a brain a software aspect too, right? Which we, we, we don't really have much clues about, it seems to me. Um, I, I would agree with that. Almost any higher, any higher human cognitive ability like problem solving, creativity, music, art, artistic expression and dancing, music, completely unknown how the brain uh, represents that kind of information or does something creative to discover something new. That, that's very far from what the neuroscience of today can handle. Yeah, so that goes to your sort of theme here, if I understand this correctly, Henry, that uh, behavior and, um, and the nervous system, um, you know, in some sense, it's a hardware-software combination we can spend a lot of time trying to understand the hardware. We might get some clues, some ideas, but it doesn't really allow us to answer the big questions. Why does the brain do it? How does it do it? Those types of questions, which is sort of a combination question, um, which is in some sense emanates from understanding the behavior more, more holistically, right? Is that, is that the way to think about it? I, I think that is. I, I would add that um, you haven't mentioned something that I would add, which is neurobiologists have been doing an incredible job in the last few decades of advancing our knowledge of the hardware, as you said. What you haven't mentioned is in parallel an extraordinary uh, independent effort facilitated by technology and facilitated by computers and software, where we now know how we now know how to measure behavior, measure just measure it and classify it and quantify it way better than anything in the past. So there are research labs that can study a thousand flies in parallel, watching each one of them move at the same time with automated software that sees what they're moving in response to this olfaction or temperature. And there, there are people who have followed animals for thousands of hours with high precision um, cameras. And, and so we're in the middle, not only of just of a neuroscience, neurobiology revolution where we're understanding the details of the hardware. For the first time, we're actually collecting hard objective data of what behaviors many animals are doing. And the scary thing is what they're doing is way more complicated and intricate than what people thought. And, and so the, it, separately of the hardware, we're discovering the behavior is far more complicated. And that in, it further increases the complexity of the question of what do you mean by understanding the brain? Are you going to try to understand all these intricate behaviors that a fly or even a sea elegans are capable of the, the the early days were nice we were ignorant and there were simple behaviors and you could sort of develop a theory of okay if i kick you on the knee i can see why you're going to move your leg but now you're looking at at flies in the real environment and they have multiple choices and they're receiving sensory input from many different organs simultaneously how do you describe that and, and then ask what the nervous system is going to do with all that sensory input so i, I think understanding nervous systems has become more complex just because our technology for measuring behavior. And, and we still don't know that your original question about what's a human intelligence, that seems further away than ever. How, how to quantify that is still extremely difficult. So, so there are two questions there, right? And the one is, um, can we have predictability? So this is sort of, you know, if I advance hypothesis, if I can predict something and then I can measure it, then I know there's something that I know. Then there is more of a conceptual question. Do we understand the system? Right. And so going back to the weather example that you mentioned, it is still the case that we can't really predict precisely what's going to happen next week. Uh, but, but we may have, I don't know much about this, but we may have a more broad understanding of how weather systems form. Right. Um, and so is there a similar thing going on on the behavior side? We, we still can predict that C. elegans X, what, what uh, he or she is going to do tomorrow, 
but we could have some broad understanding of how behavior emanates, sort of an emergent property. Yeah, I, I, I say that's exactly what the direction of neuroscience is. I, th I think neuroscience will start looking a little bit like meteorology, or already is, where certain questions don't seem to be possible to answer, period. We'll never collect the data, or, or the data, or, or because of these nonlinear ideas, we can't use the data to make precise forecasts. But there will be general patterns that we do understand. For example, something that all animals are capable of doing is simple association. If something nasty happens, you can remember, remember, remember something of the environment of why that nasty thing happened to you. Maybe it was a poisonous food, maybe a, a, um, a, a region that's very hot and dry and you want to avoid that because you won't survive. So the ability to associate is a natural evolutionarily selected behavioral mechanism. And you would expect that to be universal. And, and forget the nervous system, you, you would expect any nervous system to evolve to be able to produce associations. But then when you get to higher levels of cognition, then, then things get very complicated about what's needed for survival and then things. So, so I, I think what you said is my view of how neuroscience will progress, that there'll be a couple of specific questions that we can answer clearly, and they tend to be very narrow behavioral ones. When, when you taste something bad, why do you spit it out? And, and when, a, when you see something coming in, out of, in your part of your vision, like a ball that someone threw at you unexpectedly, you start ducking, those questions will be answered to a satisfactory extent. But as you get to questions that take minutes to, of, of information processing, like when am I gonna eat for dinner? Or when I'm in the supermarket, am I gonna buy this box of cereal versus another? Or you know, what do I buy a friend as a birthday gift, which is very hard for many people. Um, I don't know how you're gonna predict it. And what I'm guessing is it'll be like quantum mechanics where all you'll be able to do is predict the likelihood of certain specific behaviors, but you won't be able to predict a, a particular behavior. Yeah. It, it, it won't be deterministic. All the, and this is true of the weather system. What we know now, what the weather says today on your cell phone is 20% chance of rain. And, and it'll be like 20% Jill is not going to like this, what we're talking about. 70% he does. 10% he's indifferent. That will be the kind of future of neuroscience where categories of broad behavior rather than precise might be predictable and there those are easy to those will be possible to categorize understand but, but specific behaviors might lie beyond what what we can for the foreseeable future and maybe there's a theorem like Lorenz's analysis that will never be possible for, for yeah, reasons yeah. That, that we'll understand so so I want to finish up with so another chapter that you're working on uh, memories forgetting dreams and spin glasses Right. The Hopfield model of associative memory. Right. Um, so, so you want to you want to talk a bit about that? I don't. Uh, I haven't had a chance no, to read it. One, one of the um, one of, one of the most spectacular theoretical advances in in theoretical neuroscience, and I would argue in science and biology in general, was a extremely self, simple simple in the sense of mathematical. I'm afraid it's not so simple in the sense of how I how would you invent it or analyze it, but John Hopfield, who's a world leader in biophysics and theoretical neuroscience, in, 19, in the early 1980s, while working at Bell Labs and interacting with condensed matter scientists and biologists, came up with an extraordinarily simple model of how to do associative memory. Associative memory is, where, is, is what nearly all organisms do, where if you get partial information, you can retrieve an entire memory. So, so many of us have memorized songs that we like, in an example of associative memory is you hear two seconds of a favorite song. And just knowing any two seconds of that song, you can suddenly recall the entire song, the lyrics, the day you first heard it, maybe the people you were with. Um, the the, the, the memory is not encoded by a, a mailbox address, like on a house, where you have to look up the address and then see what's in the mailbox. The memory itself encodes itself, which is a very strange but also very reasonable way to evolve a memory. You, so I feel came up with a elegant, concise, simple mathematical model that showed using plausible biological ideas how to put a group of neurons together that could implement an associative memory. And here's the key point. This model was not unfamiliar. This model turned out to be very similar to a model 
that a group of physicists having nothing to do with biology were thinking about at a problem at Bell Labs called a spin glass, which is a, a disordered alloy of copper and, and iron. There was a group of people who were just asking a simple question. If I start with pure copper, which is not magnetic, and I start adding a few iron atoms more and more, eventually, if I have pure iron, it turns into a, a magnetic substance. What happens in the middle? And it turns out something very unusual happened as you go from pure copper to pure iron, which was a disordered phase of iron atoms called, which we now call a spin glass. And lo and behold, the mathematical structure of the model that Hockfield proposed when coding a memory was identical basically to the mathematical model of these spin glasses. And all, when this was realized by the physics community, all kinds of big muscle theorists in, in the kinetics matter community brought their extremely sophisticated tools for thinking about magnetism into the theoretical neuroscience community and jump-started an enormous effort where people used magnetic analogies to try to think about memory. And this, by the way, is not, was not just a lock, it's still the leading way that many theorists thinking in neuroscience think about memory. By the way, it's not a universal cure. There are other, many other areas of brains and behaviors where this magnetic analogy is not the best or the even relevant, but for things related to learning and memory, this connection between condensed, a branch, a very narrow specialized branch of theoretical condensed matter physics and neuroscience was a revelation. And so in this last chapter of my book, I try to, as best I can to a general audience who doesn't know physics or neuroscience, I try to explain what is the logic of this Hopfield model. Fortunately, it can be explained by a lot of technical background and I try to explain the remarkable predictions that this model makes. For example, if you start to store too many memories, Hockfield was able to predict the maximum number of memories that his model could store. And unlike a computer, when you start to reach, get towards the maximum number of memories, bad things happen to your ability to record memories. And you know, th th this is a, one of the best examples of how people with a non-neurobiology background can come, can, up, can come up with an idea and way of thinking that no neurobiologist would have come up with just by experimental analysis. And, and it produced, a, for many decades now, a very productive, fruitful way of thinking about memory and learning. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, so we look forward to uh, the publication of the book, Henry. And uh, uh, thanks so much uh, for this. This has been excellent. Thanks so much for spending time with me. My pleasure. Nice to meet you and take care. Thank you. Very good. Bye.